Right, welcome along everyone. We, we're here this evening to um, have an introduction to grasshoppers and crickets. My name's Alice Parfit. I am a conservation officer with um, Bug Life um, and really pleased that everyone's here today to um, find out a little bit more about some of our um, special insects. Um, so as I said, we're going to um, be chatting through um, our our uh, grasshoppers and crickets, and then I'm going to give a little bit of an update on the wart biter um, bush cricket um, at the end, and then we'll have plenty of time for a few questions at the end. So if you've got any questions, do just pop them in the chat, um, and um, we'll try and get through some of those um, um, at the end. So. Um, for some reason, I cannot, um, I can't scroll on. Let's see. Oh, there we go. I can scroll on. So um, this evening, this, this webinar is being brought to you as part of the Changing Chalk project. So this is a, um, a, a landscape partnership connecting nature, people, heritage, um, on and around the East and South Downs in Sussex. So if you guys um, aren't in Sussex, there's a little map of where we where we are. So the Changing Chalk Partnership is led by the National Trust, but we've got um, 10 partners involved in working on all sorts of projects um, to engage um, people in, in sort of nature's recovery um, and get people out and enjoying the South Downs, learning about both the wildlife and, and it's sort of history really as well. So we're funded through the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, and as part of this partnership, Bug Life are involved in a couple of projects, one of which is the Walk Biter Bush Cricket Recovery Programme, which I'm obviously gonna talk about in a little bit. But first up, I'm really pleased to have my uh, colleague, Karim Vahid here tonight, who's gonna give us um, an introduction to grasshoppers and crickets. The plan is that he is going to uh, talk for around 30, 35 minutes. Then I'll tell you a little bit about um, the walk biter and how you can get involved with our projects. And I said some time for questions um, at the end. So um, without further ado, I'm actually going to just stop sharing my screen and hopefully Karim will be able to share his now. Hey, can you see that, Alice? I can see that, yes. Fantastic. So thank you, Alice, and thank you for inviting me to talk about grasshoppers and crickets of the UK. Now, I'll try and keep this within time because I could waffle on for some time about my favourite topic. Um, I've actually been into grasshoppers and crickets since childhood, so I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So in the quick overview of grasshoppers and crickets today. Um, I'll talk a bit about their classification, um, a bit about differences between crickets and grasshoppers. Um, we'll have a brief look at some pretty common species that you're likely to come across. Um, then there's the topic of, on the one hand, range expanding species that are becoming more common, and then on the other hand, rare species that, if anything, are becoming more rare or at least um, hanging on in there. So that's what we'll look at um, this evening. But starting off, really, my fascination with crickets and bush crickets began with this species, the great green bush cricket, Tetagonia viridissima. I was on holiday down in Devon um, as a young teenager. Now at home, I'd already developed a fascination for insects and was keeping things like praying mantises and stick insects. And when I came across a great green bush cricket, it struck me that they were every bit as exotic as the tropical um, stick insects and praying mantises that I was keeping at home. And I was immediately fixated by the world of bush crickets. In fact, I've just realized I've got uh, a specimen of a great green bush cricket there that I kept as a pet this summer, having found it down in Devon. So great green bush crickets have been very important to me in my orthoptera journey. I was lucky enough to be able to make something of a career out of my fascination for bush crickets. Um, I, I actually did my PhD on bush cricket mating systems and then uh, lectured at uh, Derby University for nearly 30 years 
um, not just on bush crickets, but on zoology and entomology and continued my research on bush crickets, um, moving on to their conservation after looking at their mating behavior. I'm now England manager at Bug Life, where I've been for a year and a half, and I've continued being able to work um, with crickets and bush crickets, amongst many other things. So first of all, the classification. Now, grasshoppers, crickets, and relatives are in the order Orthoptera. I sometimes feel a bit of a fraud as an entomologist who's particularly interested in Orthoptera when I compare myself to people who are into flies or wasps. I mean, with about, what is it, 150 species of solitary bee and 2,700 species of ichneumon wasp, um, we've got a relatively small fauna, which are easy to identify. But that makes them very nice group to work with. Um, they're relatively large, relatively charismatic. Um, many of them produce sound, which are very species specific. So that's another way you can identify them. And it adds to the uh, range of, of characters that you can use. So the order Orthoptera itself is divided into two different suborders. Now, I'm often asked, what's the difference between crickets and bush crickets? And quite often people show me a photograph, say, of a grasshopper and say, I found this cricket in my back garden. Um, so first of all, I think in this talk, we'll have a little bit more of a look at what the difference is between crickets and bush crickets. Technically speaking, they belong to two very different suborders within the Orthoptera. So on the one hand, you have the suborder Encifera. Encifera actually means sword bearer. So the suborder Encifera, um, the name refers to the long sword-like ovipositors, egg-laying tubes of the females. So Encifera contains the crickets and their relatives. On the other hand, you have the Califera, which includes grasshoppers, locusts, uh, groundhoppers, and relatives. The two suborders actually split off in evolutionary terms before the dinosaurs. So they're really quite distinct in evolutionary terms, and there's quite a few differences between them. Within the crickets and relatives, you have a series of different groups. So here I've shown um, the subfamilies that are found within the UK. There are many other subfamilies in the tropics. Um, so we have within the Encifera, we have the true crickets, uh, the Griloidae. And then we also have the bush crickets, the Tetagonioidae. On the other hand, within the Califera, the grasshoppers and relatives, we have the grasshoppers, the Acridoidea, and the groundhoppers, the Tetragoidea. We'll have a bit more of a look at these groups as we move on. But first of all, let's go back to the fundamental difference between the Encifera and the Califera, between the crickets and the grasshoppers. A very obvious difference is the antennae or feelers. So with crickets and bush crickets on the one hand, the antennae are usually as long as or longer than the body. There are some exceptions, but generally speaking, they have very long antennae. The reason for that may partly relate to the ancestors of crickets and bush crickets being more nocturnal and having to literally feel their way around more, whereas the ancestors of the grasshoppers and relatives are probably more diurnal, more day living, and probably have to use less on the sense of touch. So in the grasshoppers, the antennae are quite short, as you can see on the right. They're usually much shorter than the body. Difference number two, the ovipositor. The ovipositor is a handy egg-laying tube, which allows you to insert your eggs much deeper into whatever substrate they're in, so that they're going to be much safer. In crickets and bush crickets, the egg-laying tube, the ovipositor, is sword or needle-like. So on the left-hand side there, you have a close-up of the ovipositor of the long-winged conehead, a native species. And you can see that it's very long and sword-like very good for inserting eggs at some depth. They insert them in uh, lots of different substrate, and sometimes the structure of the egg-laying tube actually reflects the sort of substrate they lay in. Um, the coneheads often insert their eggs into sort of tussocks of grass, clumps of grass. On the right-hand side, you see a female grasshopper, in this case, the lesser marsh grasshopper. 
the ovipositor there isn't really visible. It's a series of little valves. Um, the abdomen itself is sort of extended into the soil as they lay their eggs. Now, while the crickets tend to lay eggs individually, grasshoppers and relatives, which include locusts, tend to lay their eggs in an egg pod, often surrounded by a frothy material. Difference number three, sound production. One thing that all members of the order Orthoptera have in common is that many of them sing. The male calls to attract a female. In some species, the female even has a response song and replies to the male's call. The mode of sound production is different. Both rely on the basic mechanism, which is similar to running your nail, your fingernail along a comb to make a sound. It involves a sort of row of pegs and a sort of scraper that's moved along. But the position of the pegs and the scraper differs fundamentally between crickets and grasshoppers. So in the crickets and relatives, these um, the process involves moving one forewing, the tegmina, against the other forewing. In the grasshoppers, however, at least the species we have in the UK, it involves moving the hind leg against the forewing. So the mode of sound production is really quite fundamentally different between the two groups, although in the tropics, a wider range of sound production mechanisms are found within grasshoppers. A lesser known fact is the position of the ears. Now, as mammals, we tend to think that ears are going to be on your head. But in fact, in neither grasshoppers nor crickets are the ears anywhere near the head. In crickets, they're actually on the forelegs, um, as you can see by the red arrows. Now, this is a speckled bush cricket, and these are the forelegs of the male on the left hand side. And the red arrows indicate where the actual ears are. The structure of the ears in the bush cricket quite fascinatingly, are fairly similar to that of humans, despite the fact that they're on the legs. Um, there is, um, you can see a shape that collects the sound and within there's a sort of eardrum like uh, membrane as well. In grasshoppers, on the other hand, the ears are actually on the side of the abdomen. So on the old fashioned diagram on the right, um, you can see a red arrow and that shows a large sort of membranous area um, just above the hind leg. And that is, in fact, the auditory organ, the ear of the grasshopper. Finally, another key difference is that most grasshoppers tend to be vegetarian. Um, many of our grasshopper species, not surprisingly, feed on grass. Um, in crickets, however, uh, many species are omnivorous. And in fact, some of the bush crickets go quite a long way towards carnivory. Here we have a great green bush cricket that successfully caught a, um, a peacock butterfly and is eating it. And I've kept great green bush crickets in captivity and they readily eat things like grasshoppers. And you can see them grabbing them mantis-like almost with their front legs, which are also spiny um, in order that they can hang on to their prey. Species like the oak bush cricket are particularly carnivorous and uh, eat largely aphids and other small insects. Um, but some are, have a very mixed diet and are quite omnivorous. So moving on from the differences between grasshoppers and crickets, we'll now look at a few common species of grasshopper. Now, these are species that you can pretty much find all over southern England. Um, and some stretching quite a long way north. So the lesser marsh grasshopper was at one time restricted to fairly damp marshy habitats, sometimes coastal, but now seems to have adapted to have a much wider range of habitats and can be found even in gardens. Um, and that has spread quite um, further west and northwards. The lesser marsh grasshopper has a sort of pale stripe down its wings and the wings are particularly long not often not reaching the end of the abdomen the field grasshopper perhaps our most common one of our most common species cortipus bruneus um a, the typical color form there a rather gray 
in color is shown but they're just to confuse things there are a variety of different color forms actually of all of these species some of them even uh, some pink and purple color morphs are even found occasionally we also have the common green grasshopper below Omocestus virgilis which again is very common in grasslands um, and the meadow grasshopper uh, Cortipus parallelis again very common in grasslands the best way to distinguish the field grass or the grasshopper, the common green grasshopper and the meadow grasshopper is actually by their calls, which are incredibly distinctive. Um, the field grasshopper uh, just caught the male sings as a sort of series of brief zips like zip, 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 zip. Uh, the common green grasshopper has a much longer sort of ticking sound, almost like a ticking watch sort of. Whereas the meadow grasshopper sounds a bit like it's chuckling, a sort of a so quite often you'll find all three together in uh, in a grassland and you can you can tell quite easily um, which of them are actually actually present groundhoppers however don't actually sing they don't make a sound at all groundhoppers are a much neglected and interesting group of orthoptera mainly because they're very small. They're only about a centimetre long. They're really quite different from the other grasshoppers. Um, the other grasshoppers tend to overwinter as eggs, which hatch out in the spring, and they become adult around the middle of July, die off by the end of October. The groundhoppers are quite different. They will overwinter as adults, and that means you can pretty much find the adults at any time of the year. You can find them quite early on in the spring when it starts becoming sunny, even about this time of year. They're often found on fairly open ground as well. They can be found in woodlands, grasslands, a variety of habitats, but they are found often on, on the soil itself where they feed um, on lichens. A characteristic thing about them is that the thorax has uh, an extension that extends right over the wings like a sort of spike. Moving on to some common bush crickets. Um, Another one of my favourites is the dark bush cricket, Volidoptera griziatra. They form wonderful sort of choruses of males alternating singing with each other in hedgerows, especially in places um, like Devon and Dorset. Often the hedgerows are absolutely alive with calling dark bush crickets. Uh, the male is shown there and it has very short wings. It can't fly. Uh, it only sings with its wings and the female is virtually wingless. Then on the left, Top left, you have the speckled bush cricket, a wonderful little fat green thing. Um, again, it's only about a centimetre and a half long. It's very much more found on trees and shrubs, things like brambles. A really good way of finding bush crickets is to actually, on fairly sunny mornings, which aren't too hot, um, when, a sunny sp when the clouds part and the sun comes out quite early in the morning, to look um, on the vegetation. And that's often how you'll find a speckled bush cricket. You'll see it sitting. They love to sunbathe. They're quite warmth loving and they love to warm themselves up in the early sun. So if you look at um, for places like brambles in the early morning sun and you often find these little plump uh, round bush crickets sat there. The long winged conehead below is more of a, a grass loving species. It's often found in sort of salt marshy areas. Um, but also in long, rough grassland. And this is one of the species that's been expanding its range recently. Another species that's been expanding its range, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a second, is Roselle's bush cricket. That is perhaps becoming one of our most common bush crickets. It has a very distinctive, high-frequency, continuous um, call. Um, and it's really becoming very frequent, in again, in very rough, grassland type habitats. In fact, we'll next talk about range expansion using Roselle's bush cricket as an example. Now, one thing about Roselle's bush cricket, as you may have noticed from the photograph, it comes in two wing morphs. So compare the bottom right hand uh, photograph, that's the typical short winged form, which can't fly, but it also occasionally throws up this long winged morph which is very capable of flight and can fly quite a considerable distance. The long winged form seems to be often more common at high population densities or off, um, 
the year after a really hot summer or even two years after a really hot summer because sometimes the eggs take as many as, as long as two years to two seasons to develop this photograph actually which i took a couple of years ago was the most northerly record for the species at the time this was photographed on the north york moors um not far from whitby when i was a lad in the 1980s the species had a very restricted distribution it was one of our species that was found on the coast and at very low elevations therefore and it was found in salt marshes around the thames estuary and a few records up in the humber estuary since that time it has started to expand northwards and westwards in fact here is a distribution map to show the changing distribution over the years so the yellow is prior to 1980 as you can see focused around the thames estuary um, the green is 1980 to 1989 um, the pale blue is 1990 to 1999 the dark blue is 2000 to 2009 and then the dark purple is 2010 to 2019 so you can see how it's steadily been moving across the country and up the country it's thought that this is in relation to climate change. It's a very warmth loving species. And in the UK previously, only the lowest altitude coastal locations were actually suitable for it. But now with the changing climate, with warmer summers, uh, warmer springs, uh, it's able to colonize uh, a wide, increasingly wide area. Um, one brief study I did just focused on around where I live in Derbyshire and Staffordshire was to look at how the altitude of records was changing. So this is a graph showing the altitude of records submitted to iRecord um, from 2011 to 2020. And as you can see, not only is the species moving across and up the country, it's also changing in altitude. It's much more able to exist at higher altitudes, which previously would have been too cold for it. Um, so we're finding it up to about breeding populations up to about 300 um, meters. Roselle's bush cricket isn't the only one to have been expanding its range. And in fact, we've recently had quite a few additions to our fauna. Several species have been expanding their ranges within mainland Europe and then expanding further into England. One of these is the large conehead, Raspolia nitidula. It's pretty unmistakable. It, it could perhaps be mistaken for a great green bush cricket. It's of a similar size, but it's much more elongated uh, with a much more pointy head. Raspolia nitidula has only recently been found in the UK, um, especially down in Dorset. And in fact, when I was in um, Wareham in Dorset last summer, I heard a strange high-pitched buzzing sound, continuous high-pitched buzzing sound coming from marshland. And I couldn't work out what it was at the time because it didn't seem to fit with any calls of our UK bush crickets. But subsequently, um, I think that there's a really good population in Wareham of the large conehead. And so I think that's worth going back and me inspecting a bit further at some point. But certainly there have been other um, breeding populations recorded at other parts of the country. And as the climate continues to change, I'd predict that this species will soon become quite widespread and common. This is the distribution on the continent of the species in 2003 compared to the distribution in 2023. And as you can see, it's expanding throughout its range, including moving up into England. Another species that's been very successful in expanding, which is quite surprising, is the southern oak bush cricket. Surprising because it's actually wingless and flightless. Well, it has very tiny wings. It's micropterous. This is an adult male uh, southern oak bush cricket. It's very closely related to the oak bush cricket, which is fully winged as an adult and otherwise looks more or less the same. Oak bush crickets and southern oak bush crickets are very distinctive in that the males have this great big long pair of pincer-like organs, um, the cerci, which are very long. 
I've actually studied their mating behavior and the male uses these to grasp the female and maintain a strong hold on her during the prolonged copulation. The species is rapidly expanding in its range. Um, so the map above shows the distribution records in prior to the year 2000. Um, and the map below shows the distribution records in 2023. And as you can see, it's expanded greatly, including expanding uh, right up into northern England. As I say, this is quite unusual because the species can't fly. So how did it get here? Well, it's been suggested that it's very good at hitchhiking on cars, and it might well have hitchhiked on cars coming through the uh, Channel Tunnel, for example. Although it does seem to have expanded very quickly for a species that can't fly. The flip side of species that are expanding in their range under climate change is species that are actually remaining quite rare. With a change in climate, there will be some winners and there will also be many losers. We tend to find that generalist species, which are good at colonizing, seem to be doing quite well. On the flip side, specialist species, which are poor dispersers, don't seem to be doing so well. One of these is the large marsh grasshopper. This is our largest species of grasshopper. Um, it's almost locust-like in its appearance. Um, it's restricted to fairly damp bog environments, and the strongest populations have been found down in the New Forest. A recent um, conservation measure has been taken to captive breed these by um, a group called Citizen Zoo. They've actually been captive breeding them and releasing them to new sites in Norfolk, which was within the former range of the species. Formerly, the species was found in Norfolk um, and parts of Surrey um, and also down in the New Forest. But drainage of its wetland habitat and the wetland habitat drying out has led to its decline. So there's an effort on to uh, restore and um, translocate populations to new locations. Another incredibly rare species, also found in the New Forest, is the mole cricket. Now, the mole cricket, just like the great green bush cricket, is again one of my favourites. It is a true cricket. Um, it's within the superfamily Grilloidae, but it's got its own family, uh, the Grylotalpidae, which literally means mole cricket or cricket mole. Um, its forelegs are very much like a mole's forelegs. Um, they're almost spade-like and very short, and it's very good at digging tunnels. It spends most of its life underground. It will eat on uh, soil invertebrates, um, include, including earthworms, and it will also burrow into um, the odd crop. In fact, it used to be considered an, ag an agricultural pest, but now it's one of our rarest insects. In fact, we even thought it might be extinct in the UK, until um, a tiny population was rediscovered in the New Forest, which still seems to be um, just about hanging on in there. Um, it's very large. Um, they can get to sort of a couple of inches long, um, up to you know six centimeters long. So it's a, it's a very substantial and chunky and large species and quite fascinating for its unusual behavior. They tend to um, overwinter as nymphs and become adult in the spring and you can hear them singing um, in sort of April May time. Um, their song is quite easy to confuse with that of something like a nightjar, um, quite a continuous um, uh, song. So it'll be very interesting to monitor the populations and um, we hope that something can be done to uh, restore the populations of this species. Occasionally, reports of mole crickets occur from other parts of the country. It's thought that sometimes they're imported um, in flower pots and at garden centres. And there are a variety of species of mole cricket across Europe. So not all of the mole cricket records we get in England are necessarily Grylotalpa Grylotalpa, the native species of mole cricket. Um, but we're very interested in doing some further work on this uh, species in the future. 
Another particularly rare species is the field cricket. Now, this is your typical Jiminy cricket. Um, it's got became incredibly rare in the UK, having been much more widespread across southern England. Uh, at one point, it was reduced to just a single population of only um, less than 100 individuals um, in Sussex. Since then, a captive breeding program at London Zoo, Invertebrate Conservation Centre and various initiatives such as Back from the Brink have bred the species in captivity and have translocated it to new sites. Um, Mike Edwards down in Sussex has been surveying it, uh, monitoring it and um, helping translocate it to new sites. So Sussex is still a stronghold um, for the species where it's been translocated to quite a few new successful populations. But these require ongoing habitat um, interventions to keep them in early successional stages sort of on the sort of heathland type areas that they're found to prevent encroachment of things like bracken. So it's still a species that's sort of hanging on in there in the UK and needs our intervention to maintain. It's flightless and it doesn't seem to be expanding its range um, on the continent either, um, unlike uh, the other species we were talking about. Now, the last species I'll talk about before handing back over to Alice is, again, one of my favourites. This is the fabulous Atlantic Beach Cricket or Scaly Cricket. Now, I'm a great fan of it, but not everyone sees its attraction. To be fair, it does look like a small brown earwig, um, which is found in coastal shingle. I think it's its habitat that makes it so fascinating. The natural habitat, oh, and incidentally, this is why it's called a Scaly Cricket. This is an electron micrograph um, of the surface of the cricket, which is clothed in tiny scales, just like on a butterfly's wing. The natural habitat of the species is shingle beaches. So it's only found in England, in uh, Branscombe in Devon, uh, Chesil Beach um, in Dorset, and, uh, and one small site in between. Um, we think it might be under recorded though, and it'd be very interesting to do some further trapping around, for example, the southeast of England on some of the shingle beaches. Um, I've been monitoring the UK populations using pitfall traps. So I sink a plastic pint glass into the shingle, bait it with uh, go cat tuna and herring flavoured cat biscuits, um, and I a few pebbles around it and a flat rock to stop the seagulls eating the uh, the cat biscuits and you leave it you set them up late in the evening to avoid dog walkers trampling on them and dogs eating them and then you come back the next morning and see what you've caught and that's how i've been monitoring the uk populations it'd be very interesting to do something similar um across the southeast of the country where it's possible they occur but have just not been recorded they're classed as vulnerable by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So they're classed as vulnerable in the whole of their range, which extends all down the Atlantic coast of, uh, of Europe as far as Morocco. Um, they're thought to be under threat potentially by increasing storm surges um, and severe storms uh, linked to climate change because they live within the shingle and come out at night to feed on the strand line. So they're an entirely beach living species, which is very unusual for our UK orthoptera. A final rare species, which I won't talk about because Alice is going to, is Decticus ferrucivorus, the uh, wartbiter bush cricket. And this is my very bad picture of a wartbiter bush cricket, but Alice is going to show you some much better pictures where you can actually see the cricket. But it does illustrate how hard it is to spot amongst the grass. So over to you, Alice, to talk about the Wartbiter and your fabulous work that you've been doing as part of Changing Chalk. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Karim. That was really interesting. I'm going to talk about um, our Wartbiter bush crickets um, now. Um, and this is, um, as, as um, Karim has just sort of said about some of the other species, this is actually one of our rarest and most endangered um, insects in um, in the UK. So, um, and this is our walk biter up at the uh, top right hand um, of our screen there. So um, often quite hidden in the grass like that. And they are restricted to um, uh, chalk grassland sites and only known from six sites in the UK now. So um, yeah, pretty, pretty rare. 
Um, but interestingly enough, um, within their European range, they um, um, they are more common. So really, there are species that are at the edge of their northern range. Um, and yes, yeah, so in the UK, only known from six six sites now. Four of those are in Sussex and in the Changing Chalk project area. Uh, one in Wiltshire and one in Kent as well. And um, they are, let's go on to the next slide. So this is our um, female wart biter. They're quite large for orthoptera. So it's about three centimetres long, three, three and a half centimetres long. Um, and that's the body. And then this is um, our female wart biter. So you can see her ovipositor um, just on the end there. So that's her, her ovipositor. So that can be another two centimeters um, as well. So they're quite a big, um, a big cricket. Um, certainly for for um, um, grasshoppers and crickets in this this country. Um, and one of the ways that we know that this is a, a wart biter is that in the females, her ovipositor is upturned like this. So that's slightly upturned. And um, I'll come on to another species in a moment where we can sort of see the difference. And then the other thing is um, the wings. They have quite short wings um, and um, they reach sort of to the end of the abdomen or just past the end of um, the abdomen. So um, uh, that's a really good sort of way of, of sort of uh, distinguishing our wart biter from some other species um, as as well. I think because I can't see my notes, I might forget something and then jump back to it um, as well. But generally, our wart biters are this lovely green colour and very nice bright green colour. They ha sometimes have sort of black blotching on either their, their wings or maybe their, their abdomen. And you'll also often find them just sort of in, in the grass like like this um so as i said they they come in sort of a green form so the bottom right here that's our our, our standard form for our wart biters that's what they normally look like but they do actually come in other color forms um as well so these are pretty rare um in the uk the the color forms are, are actually much more common um on the continent but both of these photos were taken in sussex so this is a, a purple form um on on the left and um the top right we've got sort of a, a yellow form um so yeah that's one to look at i always say oh, oh they're green but actually we can we can get other color forms um as well um and the thing that we might confuse it with is um, this species. So um, Karim touched on this very briefly. This is our great green bush cricket. Um, similar sort of size, so that the bodies are a similar sort of size. But in this species, if you look at the ovipositor, this is actually really straight. So that's a, a one sort of key identification um, feature. But the other thing you might notice is this has got really um, much longer wings. So the the, the wings um, extend out over the end of the abdomen by quite a long way. So certainly much longer. Um, than our, our wart biters. Now you might find these on the same site. So although our wart biter is um, a species of really good quality chalk grassland, so you'll find that on the really nice grassland, our great green bush cricket is much more a species um, of sort of slightly scrubbier, ranker grass, and you quite often find them in um, sort of bramble areas. So on some sites when we've got wart biters, you might find the great green bush cricket sort of around the sort of periphery of that that sort of site where there's a bit more scrub, a bit more bramble, but you won't see find them in the really nice sort of chalk grassland um, in the middle. And actually, one thing I, I didn't mention about about the wart biters earlier was that because they have these really short wings, they're another species that that don't um, don't fly at all. Um, so they only get around by by walking ar around um, the site. So that's the only species that we might um, confuse it with. Um, I'm I'm hoping that this is um, actually going to play. So the males obviously um, sing, they stridulate, 
Um, and this is supposed to um, sound like um, a series of clicks that then get faster. And it's supposed to sound like um, a bike going going down a hill, getting faster. So I'm going to attempt to play this. Hopefully this is going to work. So hopefully you guys could um could all hear that, um Absolutely. and you could hear it, Karen. Well, hopefully everybody else could as as well. You might have to turn the volume up a bit, um, but so that's how um we sort of can um distinguish most of our, our grasshoppers and crickets uh, uh, is by their song, and so that's um one thing that we do when we are monitoring them. We're listening for that sound, so getting your ear into sort of what they sound like is is really important um and this is the sort of habitat that where we might find them so they are on as like i said good quality chalk grassland um that's uh flower rich so um all of these pictures are, are taken from from walk by to sites and, and the flower the flowers aren't coming through um brilliantly but as karen mentioned um earlier our bush crickets are omnivorous so our walk biter is feeding on um plants on flowers um and um also on other insects particularly smaller grasshoppers so um having habitat that is um rich in in sort of, is flower rich and also rich in smaller in invertebrates smaller grasshoppers is really important um the life cycle of the wart biter is that um they lay their eggs in the soil so they need some patches of sort of bare ground to be able to do that um they then um take two years to to hatch so the wart biters actually have this two year um life cycle but the nymphs will hatch in April and they will then go through for, um, several stages growing up. And that's when they like quite short um, turf. And then the adults, they're fully adult by about July. Um, and those adults might um, extend in, into um, the autumn. Um, if it's a really good year, you might still see um, adults at the beginning of October. But we normally say sort of, you know, July to um, September, you might you might sort of see and hear them. So they have these requirements of different um, different sort of habitats um, throughout their life cycle. So they need sites that not are not only um, good chalk grassland, but have this um, this sort of mosaic of different habitat types. And um, so they're they're a little bit fussy. Um, you can see on the um, picture on the right hand side um that uh you can see a little bit of a scrub in in that grass and a little bit of scrub is is no problem for them as long as it obviously doesn't um start taking over um which is what can happen on some of our um chalk grassland sites so yeah really important that they have this sort of mosaic habitat on 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 the chalk grassland um and yeah so some of the the threats to our wart biters um this is the sort of thing that um, can be really detrimental to them. So this is this is um, a, a site where the um, the scrub is beginning to um, definitely take over. So we've got bits of bramble, bits of cotoneaster, bits of hawthorn in there, and actually the chalk grassland in between the scrub here is still in in is still really nice and still really good quality um, uh, chalk grassland. So um, this is a sort of you know real real sort of a problem for them. Um, so we need to make sure, you know, scrub levels are kept relatively low, um, but also inappropriate grazing can be a, a real issue for for wart biters as well. So um, they really sort of benefit from from cattle grazing in, in the autumn once the um, adults have sort of, you know, if they, they're in the egg stage again. Um, and cattle are really good because they sort of pull out bits of veg vegetation. So you get that nice sort of structure. Sheep grazing tends to take everything very short. Um, which is is not great for for the wart biter. So definitely cattle grazing um, um, in the in the autumn is what we want. 
So the sorts of things we're doing through the Changing Chalk programme are uh, working with, with landowners um, that have got wart biters on, on their site. Um, and um, we are, yeah, we're working with them, sort of encouraging them to sort of think about their grazing, maybe sort of tweaks in, in grazing. We are also um, um, sort of talking about sort of scrub management, how they can sort of get on top of um, any scrub issues, how they can get funding for that. Um, so all uh, really important um, stuff um, that, that we're really sort of working with the landowners so they they know what the wart biters need and, and um, they can thrive. And then the other things that we are doing through the Changing Chalk programme is that we are um, working with volunteers and this is how you know you guys can get involved if if you're you're interested so these are some of our wonderful volunteers that have been out learning all about wart biters um, uh, on the ground um, finding out um, what they sound like um, and undertaking surveys for that for us um, and this is very much because uh, we currently have sort of one guy that does most of the surveying in, in the UK. So he concentrates on the sort of real core sites. Um, and we really want to know whether wart biters are expanding on, on some of those um, sites uh, or not. The other thing that we're really interested in is um, whether we can undertake some translocations to, to new sites. So we are out um, looking at sort of potential sites for that. But having the monitoring in place um, to begin with is, is really important to know whether the, the populations are robust enough um, to sort of undertake that. So if you're interested at all in getting involved, um, please do drop me an email. Um, we, we're a really nice, friendly bunch of people. We go out and um, even if the walk biters aren't seen, there's always something lovely to look at. Um, on these these sites so that's my um uh that's my email do drop it down um give me uh give me an email if, if you'd like to get involved this is um just sussex based i i should um i should add 